Hello YouTube family, in this video we're going to be talking about the Immaculate Conception which we just celebrated this week on December 8th. And in this video we're going to be showing what it is, where to find it in the Bible, and answering common objections from other religions about the Immaculate Conception. Now if you ask most Christians, and even many Catholics unfortunately, people will say that the Immaculate Conception is where Jesus was born in Mary, where he was immaculately conceived in her. But that is not what it is. This dogma says that the Immaculate Conception is where Mary was born free from original sin. We all have original sin from Adam and Eve. We can see that in Romans chapter 5 and other verses, where as one man sinned, so death was passed on to all mankind because of his sin. In a sense, we inherit original sin. We inherit the sin of Adam, and we also inherit the consequence for sin, which is death. Jesus said, the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. So Adam and Eve had to die, and we have to die. But Mary was free free from original sin. God protected her from all sin so that she could sinlessly bear the sinless Son of God. Now, Adam and Eve, because they were perfect before they sinned, they had three sets of gifts. The first one are natural gifts. Mind, body, soul, intellect, that sort of thing. We all have that. The second gift they had is a perfect life in grace perfect life in God's grace. They were perfected in him because they hadn't sinned. But once they sinned, they lost that grace. They lost that life of God within them. In a sense, they had a lack of grace, a privation on their soul that we inherit through original sin. So we are born, in a sense, imperfect. We are born into sin, which is why we have to be baptized. And we receive the life of God back in our souls, back in our, uh, back in us, at the moment of baptism. We receive that divine life and grace back in our life. And so the third one are the preternatural gifts, which are integrity of body, mind, and soul, emotions. There's a harmony between our reason and emotion. There's not a concupiscence to sin. So Adam and Eve, if, if someone came by and just to make a random example, came to Adam and said some mean words to him, Adam wouldn't have a desire to, to really say something back. He wouldn't be offended. He didn't have that mm, tendency towards sin. Likewise, Mary would not have either. And she had this perfect uh, harmony between her emotions and her, her reason. And that is why the Bible says that she could ponder these things in her heart because she could see and sense the significance of this supernatural in her life. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. So if you sin, you die. But because Mary didn't sin and she was preserved from sin, she didn't have to die. And we can see this in Genesis 3.15 where God came in after Adam and Eve sinned and he said, well, first he cursed them, he cursed the devil, and he gave them curses as well as a penalty and a punishment for their sin. But he said this in Genesis 3.15, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will strike at your head, and you will strike at his heel. So let's look at this. It says, I will put enmity between you on one hand and the woman, and between your seed and and her seed. So you have two opposing sides. Enmity. The word enmity now means anger, but traditionally forever it's meant having nothing in common with the other, a complete and total opposition against. And in fact, you'll find this in James 4, 4, where it says that God is at enmity with the world. He has nothing in common with the world. He's at total opposition. The world and God don't match. You know, God's on one end, the world's at the other, spirit, flesh, totally separated. So in Genesis 3, 15, between, there's enmity, total separation between you and the woman, Mary, and between your seed and hers. So he's talking about the devil. Devil. And what is the seed of the devil? It is sin. And what is the seed of Mary? Jesus Christ, who is going to conquer that sin. Now, some people say, well, the woman is Eve, but it can't be Eve because Eve just sinned and she just participated in the devil's seed, which is sin. So, you have the woman who is prophesied, who is going to give birth to the man who is going to conquer sin. So on one hand, you have the devil and the woman. They have nothing in common. They have no sin, nothing, no evil, totally separate, just as the devil and Jesus are separate. So you have Mary and her seed on one side, and you have the devil and his seed on the other. And the two do not 
meat. Because we can also see this in Luke one twenty eight. We had just said that uh, one of the gifts that Adam and Eve had when they were perfect are supernatural gifts. They had the perfection of grace because they were perfect. But once they sinned, they lost that uh, initial perfection. They lost the life of God and the grace of God within them. So they had a lack. And when we're born, we have a privation or a lack of grace on our soul the moment we're born. In other words, we're imperfect. We don't have the full life and grace of God within us that we receive back at baptism. But Mary, she had that. That is why the angel greeted her full of grace. He said, Hail, full of grace, because she didn't have this privation. She didn't have this lack. She was perfected in Christ's grace from the beginning. And some people will say, well, Stephen was full of grace too. And Jesus is full of grace in John 1 14. But the word full of grace that is used with Jesus and Stephen are the same. But a new word, a different word, and the only word ever found in the Bible I don't know of any word found in the Bible that was used for Mary. The kikariotomene is the Greek word, which means a perfection of grace. It's actually a perfect participle in Greek. So it's something that took place in the past with a present significance, meaning it's still happening right now. So this word, the only time it's used in the whole scripture, God busts it out in Luke one twenty eight to say that Mary was full of grace, or a better translation would be... Uh, uh, perfected in grace um, or o- overflowing with grace, like just having a perfection of grace. And notice that the, the angel doesn't even call her Mary. He doesn't say, hey, Mary, what's up? You're going to be full of grace like Stephen. No, he replaces her name with full of grace. It becomes a title. And we know that titles in the Bible are representative of what they are. Like Michael, God's strength. Michael isn't his real name. It's what his what who he is, God's strength. Raphael in the Bible. Raphael is not really his name, but it's a descriptive name for who he is. Medicine of God. Gabriel, messenger of God. Every title of these angels shows who they are, describes them and what they do. And so, in a sense, Gabriel now is describing Mary as full of grace. He's giving her this title as a name full of grace and saying, you don't have this lack. You don't have this privation. You are you are full of grace. You are perfect. And why would God do this? Why would God make Mary perfect? Because many Protestants get so offended that, hey, Mary can't be sinless because God's sinless. And when you say that Mary's sinless, you're saying that she's God. But really, we're not. Because God God is God. He's sinless by nature. Jesus is sinless by nature. Mary is sinless by the power of God because Jesus had the power to make her and keep her that way. Unless, of course, you don't think God's that powerful. You don't think that God could keep someone sinless if he wanted to. So Mary is not God, and she's not on par with God. The reality is that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is more about Jesus than it is about Mary. It's far more about Jesus than it is about Mary, because it's saying that some Jesus is someone so awesome, so wonderful, so holy, so perfect, so brilliant. The second person of the Trinity, he is coming to earth. And he is someone so perfect, powerful, awesome, pure, that God prepared his tabernacle ahead of time in order for him to have a pure tabernacle. So Mary was kept pure ahead of time so she could sinlessly bear the sinless, pure, holy Son of God. Just like in the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. If you read the writings of the earliest Christians for the first five centuries, they all saw Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant. Just as the old Ark of the Covenant had in it the Word of God and God's presence. So Mary, the new ark, was going to have Jesus, who is the Word of God, and the presence of God within her. And just as the old ark was supposed to be laid in pure gold and completely pure, and nobody could even touch it because they would come into contact with God and His majesty. And in fact, one person, when the Ark of the Covenant was falling, he tried to stop it from falling. He had a good will, but he was struck dead on the spot because the Bible said nothing can come into contact contact with that which is perfectly holy. And that which is perfectly holy was going to dwell in Mary for nine months. And so God prevented and protected this new Ark of the Covenant so that she would be pure for his only son. Again, this is what the earliest Christians were saying about Mary. And again, the Catholic Church is 
uh, clear that this happens only by the grace of God, by the singular merits of Jesus Christ on the cross, on Calvary, all by his power, all by his grace, by his life, by his merit, all through him. Mary has nothing of her own. She can't do anything of her own. She would be the worst sinner on earth if it wasn't for God, but God cleansed her and kept her pure. Now, some people will say, well, Mary needed a Savior. That's what the Bible says. Mary needed a Savior. And we agree. We agree that Mary needed a Savior. Everyone needs a Savior. But there's two ways of saving someone. You can fall into a pit and then take the person out and clean them off. Or you could put a plank over the pit, a board, and let the person walk across. In either case, you save their life. And what we believe is that Mary was saved in advance for her role of being the mother of God. And all God's choices are perfect. And God's perfect choice to bring salvation into the world was through Mary. Other people object to this and say, well, the Bible says all have sinned in Romans chapter 3. And it does say all have sinned, but the Bible uses the word all many times. Like the Bible says all the whole world came out to see Jesus, but really the whole world didn't come out to see Jesus. The Bible just speaks in generalizations many times. It doesn't mean every man, woman, and child. In fact, if you keep reading Romans 3, it says that there is no one righteous, nobody seeks after God, there's nobody who loves God, there's nobody who who does good. I mean, nobody. And so if we're going to take this strictly, there's nobody who seeks after God. Really, the people who are attacking uh, the Catholic Church and reading their Bible, they're seeking after God. But the Bible says specifically that there is nobody who seeks after God. They've all gone astray. But really, we haven't all gone astray. Many of us are following God. So the Bible uses generalizations and doesn't mean every single man, woman, and child. The word all doesn't always mean all. And there are many descriptions and examples of that in the Bible. And besides, if you look at a baby, a baby hasn't sinned. Someone who has special needs, many of them have never sinned and can never sin because they don't have the capability to sin. Yeah, sure, they're born into sin, but they can't actively sin themselves. So they, all, they actually haven't sinned. Many people haven't sinned. Some people say, yeah, but Mary was, you know, she sacrificed two turtle doves and she, she went up to the temple and she did this thing for sinners. I mean, sinners had to sacrifice this for their sins. And I would just point out that Jesus was born into a baptism of sinners. So there are exceptions. Mary, if she didn't go up and sacrifice those turtle doves, even if she was sinless, she would have been a sinner because she would have been going against the command of God. You had to go to the temple and make this sacrifice. Everyone did. And Mary was being a good Jew when she did that, whether she was sinless or or not, she had to do it. And Jesus was born into a, a baptism of sinners. That doesn't mean he actually sinned. Some people point out that this this can't be right, and they get afraid that this puts too much emphasis on Mary. You're taking a little girl, a humble servant girl, in the Bible, and you're making her this perfect goddess, and you're exalting her to the highest heavens, and just putting too much emphasis on her by saying that she was sinless. But in reality, I mean, the Bible does this all the time. God takes little people, and he raises them up to conquer the mighty. That's what the scriptures say, isn't it? I mean, he took the 12 apostles, 12 average fishermen, maybe under average fishermen, and he said that they were going to sit on 12 thrones in God's kingdom and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And now these 12 average fishermen are sitting on thrones judging in the kingdom of God. So God exalted them as he does all of us. And in the Bible, in Matthew 25, with the parable of the cities, somebody received a lot of cities, some received a few, and another person received only one. And the person who had received a lot of cities, I believe it was 10 cities, said that he was going to get even more because those who are responsible in small matters will be made responsible for bigger matters. So if you can prove yourself you know, responsible responsible in small things, God's going to exalt you and put you over more things. That's what scripture says. And Mary had the greatest responsibility in the world to mother the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And so God exalted her in a special way as well. Jesus is not afraid. Jesus is not, you know, encroached by, oh my gosh, my mother is taking away my glory. Or Jesus, if anyone knew who Jesus was, we they would know that neither Mary nor the apostles sitting on 12 thrones, nor us, nor anyone else could ever take away any of his glory. In fact, it brings more glory to God because it's his work in and through Mary, through the apostles, through the prophets, in and through all of us. It's all God's work and it's all God's glory.
Now, some people say, yeah, but this doctrine was invented in 1854. I mean, that's when it was proclaimed by the Pope. I mean, that's 1854 years too late. And I would just point out that that's not really accurate because people have been teaching this since the beginning of the church. I mean, Martin Luther taught that Mary was sinless. So if Martin Luther taught Mary was sinless, how could it be invented in 1854? And how could it be invented if the earliest Christians were teaching that Mary was sinless? I mean, in the first few centuries of the church. And so we look at this, and it wasn't invented in 1854. It's kind of like the divinity of Christ. Someone started doubting it for the first time in the 300s, and so for the first time we had to proclaim it. Unambiguously, officially, the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, Nicaea Council, the whole thing. Same thing. No one really doubted the Immaculate Conception, but when people did, we had to have a, an official proclamation on it in the same way. Some people will say, where does it say in the Bible that Mary was sinless? I would say, where in the Bible does it say to read your Bible? Where in the Bible does it say to find everything word for word in the Bible? This is elementary scholarship. Not everything is found word for word in the Bible. But if you understand Genesis 3.15 and the prophecy, the new Adam and the new Eve, if you understand Genesis 3.15 and the prophecy, and you understand Luke 1.28 where Mary is greeted as a title, as full of grace, and it says that she's been perfected in grace, she didn't have that lack of grace or privation of imperfection on her soul, it's easy to see that she was sinless. Now, many people read it in English. They don't understand what's going on. They understand the context of these things, and they want to see it in English 2,000 years removed, and that doesn't make sense because that whole thing falls apart. I mean, where does it say in the Bible to read the New Testament? Where does it say in the Bible to only go by the Bible? It doesn't say any of these things, but many Protestant Christians would still hold to them, even though the words aren't there, the teachings are there. And so the teaching of the Immaculate Conception is there as well. And again, this is not about Mary, it's about Jesus, how awesome and special and holy he was that God prepared his tabernacle ahead of time. And as Scott Hahn said, if you could create your mother and you were God, how would you create her? Feel free to put your comments down below. We'd love to hear from you. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel or our podcast, The Catholic Truth Podcast, feel free to do so. And please give this a like. Put a comment down below so we can help spread the word. Share it on your social media. Get it out there. And please consider supporting our ministry. We really need supporters like you to help us because we are a nonprofit and we don't exist without you. Since our last video, we've seen people giving $10 a month, $20 a month, and other donations as well. And so we really want to thank you. It's coming to the end of the year, Christmas, end of the year uh, gift giving. If you want to give a gift, especially a, a large donation to Catholic Truth so we can continue doing our work in saving souls and changing lives for Christ, defending the Catholic faith, defending 2,000 years of tradition, please consider giving to this ministry. We want to thank you for watching this video. Please check out our Facebook page down below, our Instagram, and everything else where you can follow us. God bless you.